Subject 89P13 calls itself Rocket, the result of illegal genetic and cybernetic experiments on a lower life form. What the hell? They call it Groot, a humanoid plant that's been traveling recently as 89P13's personal houseplant slash muscle. Peter Jason Quill from Terra, raised from youth by a band of mercenaries called the Ravagers, led by Yandu Udanta. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know how this machine worked. What a bunch of a-holes. This is movie night. Hello and welcome to Movie Night, in-depth film reviews in five minutes or less. Still battling a cold I developed a week ago, I'm your host Jonathan Paula. As 2014 draws to a close, it's already obvious that this has been a fantastic year for cinema, and some of the biggest releases over the summer are a great reason for that. So let's discuss four of my favorites and the one disappointment. We'll begin with The Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. This clumsily titled science fiction action film from Matt Reeves is the first sequel to the 2011 Planet of the Apes reboot and the eighth film in that franchise overall. Following its July 11, 2014 release, this $170 million adventure was a big success, scoring over $600 million at the box office. Ten years after the events of Rise, a deadly disease has wiped out most of mankind, leaving humans and superintelligent apes on equal footing. But uneasy relations between the two groups eventually leads to war. Motion capture extraordinaire Andy Serkis returns in the lead role as Caesar, the highly intelligent leader of the apes. Having built a community of talking, family-oriented primates, Circus is confronted with the responsibilities of diplomacy as he advises his people to remain peaceful and patient, signing, if we go to war, we could lose all we've built, before finishing his thought out loud by softly saying, home, family, future. As the CGI character, he is able to effortlessly bring an emotional and human performance to a decidedly non-human character. Most of this is accomplished with a furrow of his brow or with his menacing green eyes. Unfortunately, however, he's the only cast member from the last installment to return here, and while the original characters, including James Franco, are referenced, their presence here is definitely missed. Jason Clark, Gary Oldman, and Kerry Russell all portray hopeful but cautious humans who have survived horrible conditions, only to reluctantly be thrust into a war with their violent primate counterparts. We're introduced to this growing conflict when a scout party unwittingly stumbles into ape territory, sparking an extremely tense standoff, both sides on a hair trigger. Hey! 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 I'll kill you! Don't! Don't, Caesar, no! No! Meanwhile, Toby Kebbell and Judy Greer provide the voice and motion capture likenesses of two other apes that anchor the drama on screen with a surprisingly effective emotional depth. The tension that builds between these two groups is the entire driving force of the expertly paced 131 minute film, which should leave most audiences breathless as it unravels. The taller 16-9 frame brilliantly captures the lush forest areas of the American Northwest, as well as the haunting desolation of a ruined San Francisco. The visual effects from Peter Jackson's Weta Digital might be their best yet, perfect blending the authentic locations and people with digital creatures that are just as lifelike. The PG-13 rated picture doesn't have many twists or surprises, but the final climactic battle between apes, humans, and other apes is a true spectacle to behold, and one of the more exciting and well-executed action sequences in recent memory. An extended POV shot that's fixed to a mounted tank laying waste to enemy forces as bullets and fires light up the battlefield is a particular highlight. Michael Giacchino's score provides a deep and drum-like rhythm that further emphasizes the seriousness of the realistic narrative. Although we're left with a satisfying conclusion, some plot threads are appropriately left unresolved, as a third film is already slated for release in 2016. The question remains as to whether or not this rebooted franchise will come full circle with the images and stories we saw in the 1968 original, but I for one am eager to find out. Covering themes of trust, community, and betrayal, this is a touching story mixed with captivating and exciting action. An excellent summer blockbuster I can't wait to watch again. Dawn of the Planet of the Apes is the best apes yet, but let's see what you had to say about it in the YouTube comments. With 
outstanding visuals and a gripping story, we both agreed this was a worthy successor to the 2011 remake and an awesome film. For tonight's poll question, who is your favorite CGI character in history? Is it Buzz Lightyear, Gollum, or Jar Jar Binks? Leave your response as a comment below. Second up tonight, Boyhood. Following a strong showing at Sundance, this extremely ambitious project from director Richard Linklater was released theatrically on July 11, 2014. The coming-of-age drama film was produced on a small budget of only $4 million, but has already scored back ten times that amount at the box office. Shot intermittently over an 11-year period from 2002 until 2013, we're treated to a truly unique experience as we watch the talented L.R. Coltrane literally grow up right before our eyes. Co-star Ethan Hawke remarked on this captivating approach by saying, it's a little bit like time-lapse photography of a human being. The lengthy 165-minute narrative follows six-year-old Coltrane until he sets off for college 12 years later. Forced to undergo all of the awkward and embarrassing phases of adolescence and puberty in a feature film can't be easy, but Coltrane is an endearing and relatable protagonist. Aging alongside him is Patricia Arquette as the determined mother, Laura Lee Linklater as the typical older sister, and Hawk as the absent ex-husband and dad. This core group turn in some excellent performances that really carry emotional weight as their lives drift from one milestone to another. Plenty of other characters float in and out too, and much like real life, they don't always get a proper introduction or goodbye. They merely exist as players in the story of our lives for a few scenes, never to be heard from again. Thanks to its interesting production calendar, a large majority of the R-rated script evolved as they filmed, resulting in a very organic, if incohesive, narrative. Indeed, Boyhood is very inconsistently paced, moving through the grade school years within 30 minutes, but then spending over 90 when LR finally attends high school. Throughout it all, we follow Coltrane as he deals with a parade of dysfunctional father figures, drugs, girlfriends, video games, moving away from home, and discovering his own ambitions. No matter how or where you were raised, there are aspects of his character everyone can identify with. He's not the strongest kid or the most confident teenager, just an average American boy experiencing the struggles of growing up. The events of his turbulent upbringing unravel in small vignettes. They're an honest, unmanipulated view of life, perfectly encapsulating all the highs and lows of childhood. Dad, these questions are kind of hard to answer. What is so hard to answer about what sculpture are you making? It's abstract. Okay, okay, that's good. See, that's, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know you were even interested in abstract art. I'm not, they make us do it. But dad, I mean, why is it all on us though? You know, what about you? How was your week? You know, who do you hang out with? Do you have a girlfriend? What have you been up to? I see your point. So we should just let it happen more naturally, right? That's what you're saying. Okay. That's what we'll do, starting now. A campfire scene filmed in 2008, which sees Coltrane and Hawk debating the then unknown future of the Star Wars franchise is particularly amusing, and it feels so natural, almost exactly like something my dad and I would have been talking about when we were their age. Another fantastic father-son chat late in the picture puts a nice bow on everything, when Coltrane flatly asks, what's the point? Hawk's response, we're all just winging it, is as good of an explanation as any. Unfortunately, the film doesn't end on that high note, but instead drags on for another 15 minutes, in a sequence that fails to add any real value to the story. Linklater's steady and unobtrusive cinematography allows the talented actors to dictate the energy and direction of each scene. With no original score of its own, the film smartly includes plenty of popular music from across the years, which quickly provide context to when each moment takes place. It's weird to call any story set during the 21st century as a period film, but that's precisely what this feels like. Definitely worth seeing at least once, if not for the incredible filmmaking methods, than for its compelling characters. Although it lacks some focus, this is an effortless narrative that has a nostalgic quality to it that is impossible to ignore. Boyhood utilizes unique techniques to craft a wonderful experience about growing up. And here's what you had to say about it in the YouTube comments. Praise was overwhelmingly positive for this one, with you calling it memorable, brilliant, and groundbreaking. Your scores average to an awesome. A magical film that will almost certainly score a Best Picture nomination. I'll give it a 9 out of 10 as well. Next up tonight, the biggest movie of the summer, Guardians of the Galaxy. The latest, and dare I say most ambitious effort from Marvel Studios was released worldwide on August 1st, 2014 to rave reviews and massive success, grossing over half a billion dollars in a single month. Produced on a budget of $170 million, this sprawling space epic follows Chris Pratt in the lead role, a human light years from Earth caught up in a massive manhunt for a mysterious orb. When asked why he wants to save the galaxy, the Parks and Rec star angrily yells, because I'm one of the idiots who lives in it! 
Fortunately, he does get help along the way from a few truly bizarre aliens. Zoe Saldana as a green-skinned professional assassin, Dave Bautista as a muscled-up brute who doesn't understand metaphors, Vin Diesel as a walking 12-foot tree who can only speak a single phrase, and Bradley Cooper as a gun-wielding talking raccoon. Together, the ragtag quintet make up our titular heroes and are endlessly fun to watch spar and collaborate with each other. All threats and antagonists aside, I could watch an entire movie of just these five characters running errands and bickering amongst themselves. But for better or worse, this is a superhero film, so we do need a villain. And while Lee Pace fits the bill, he's honestly pretty forgettable and disposable in that role. Meanwhile, other recognizable names like Michael Rooker, Jimon Hansu, John C. Riley, Benicio Del Toro, and Glenn Close populate the 122-minute story with smaller, but no less effective performances. Every player here does a fantastic job, but special mention needs to be made for Pratt, who truly carries the film with his charisma and humor, recounting the plot of the 1980s movie Footloose to an unsuspecting ally in the guise of an inspirational speech. Later, when confronted with a seemingly unwinnable situation, he just starts singing to himself and challenges his adversary to an impromptu dance-off. In this, the tenth entry in Marvel's cinematic universe, it's easy to take special effects for granted, but the visuals here are nothing short of incredible, especially since every single location and cosmic environment has been created from scratch. From the volcanic planet of Morag to a giant floating criminal outpost called Nowhere, the attention to detail and realism here is a sight to behold. Although director James Gunn has been kicking around Hollywood for years, this PG-13 rated extravaganza is easily his biggest project yet, and he absolutely delivers the goods, framing the attractive cast with bright and colorful lighting inside the steady, anamorphic frame. There's an effective and atmospheric score from Tyler Bates that's all but overshadowed by the picture's remarkable pop music soundtrack, often heard through Pratt's in-film Sony Walkman. In an otherwise unfamiliar universe, the inclusion of so many great songs from the Jackson 5, the Runaways, Blue Swede, and others really anchors his picture in a wonderful and necessary way. In fact, the picture's soundtrack became the only album in history to reach the number one spot on the U.S. Billboard charts without a single original track. We don't leave now, we will be blown the bits. No! We're not leaving without the orb. If you like making love at midnight in the dunes on the cape, behold. I'm the love that you've looked for. Right to me and escape. This one shows spirit. She'll make a keen ally in the battle against Roman. Companion. What were you retrieving? You're an imbecile. Great excitement for all ages, this film also reminds audiences that no matter how weird or alone you may seem, there's always someone else out there willing to help. I'm sure this movie has some flaws and mistakes, but to be frank, I was having too much damn fun to even notice. Top to bottom, this is a flawlessly paced blockbuster with big thrills, great characters, beautiful visuals, funny dialogue, and spectacular action. Guardians of the Galaxy is one of the best comic book adaptations yet, and one I'll be re-watching for years to come. Lots of feedback on this one, so here are more than a few of your comment reviews. Although a few had less than stellar things to say about it, the vast majority loved this picture's visuals, humor, and entertainment factor, scoring it in amazing. An instant classic for sure, this gets a 10 out of 10 for me as well. A reminder now to check out the Movie Night Archive channel for an organized collection of all our reviews, and to hear my thoughts on upcoming movies, including my initial reaction and thoughts on the Star Wars The Force Awakens trailer. Fourth up tonight, I need to rant about The Expendables 3. This third entry in the high-stakes action-adventure franchise was released stateside on August 15, 2014, where it managed to squeak out $15 million in profit above its $90 million budget. Not that the plot matters any, but the 126-minute narrative follows lead mercenary Sylvester Stallone as he recruits a new, younger team of killers to take out his old partner, a ruthless arms dealer. Having finally ditched his unsightly mustache, Stallone leads the absolutely enormous cast with his usual dry wit and excellent fighting skills, but is far too serious for the ridiculous premise. 
Sadly, the same can't be said for anyone else. Although a number of players from previous installments like Chuck Norris, Bruce Willis, and Jean-Claude Van Damme haven't returned, the cast here is something that would have made 14-year-old Jonathan wet his bed. All right, here we go. The Expendables 3 features Jason Statham, Antonio Banderas, Wesley Snipes, Dolph Lundgren, Kelsey Grammer, Randy Couture, Terry Crews, Kellen Lutz, Ronda Rousey, Glenn Powell, Victor Ortiz, Robert Davi, Jet Li, Mel Gibson, Harrison Ford, and Aaron Schwarzenegger. And while this is unquestionably the greatest group of action stars ever assembled, it also pains me to say how horribly mismanaged and wasted they all are. Lise and Ortiz don't even punch anyone! Statham is still second build here, but is absent for a great deal of the picture. Finally returning late to bail his friend out of a jam by remarking, you were stupid enough to get yourself into this mess, and we're the only ones crazy enough to get you out of it. Meanwhile, the other returning players, Lundgren, Couture, Cruz, and Lee, have literally less than 15 lines of dialogue between them, and should have probably just been removed entirely. The new fighters get a smidge more development, but honestly, they don't deserve it. Rousey's performance is especially awful, seeming confused and unsure of herself in the massive sausage fest. I hope Stallone isn't leveraging these young guns to take over the franchise in future installments, because none of them are interesting enough for the task, and it goes against the very concept of what birthed these movies in the first place. It was wonderful to see Davi in a film again, but his single scene appearance amounts to little more than a cameo. Free from his tax evasion and direct-to-video exile, Snipes is a welcome addition, and definitely still has his ass-kicking chops, even delivering a great self-referential joke at his own expense. Grammar is featured briefly during a recruitment phase montage, and lends credibility and gravitas to the slower, plot-building aspect of the story. Ford has some of the best and most vulgar lines, and it was wonderful to see Schwarzenegger once again yell, GET TO THE CHOPPER! But the standout performances come from Banderas and Gibson, the former bringing some truly amusing comic relief and Latin charisma, while the latter is an excellent and imposing villain. In an effort to convey how sinister Gibson's war crimes have been, Stallone has shown a classified dossier with photos of dead bodies, immediately causing him to well up with emotion, in what is the most laughable and pointless scene in The Expendables 3. Are we really meant to believe that these hardened hitmen would weep at the sight of death or destruction, especially after they themselves have murdered countless hundreds of henchmen? The underutilized and bloated cast issues aside, this movie does unite the Terminator and Indiana Jones on screen together for the first time, and that's pretty damn cool. A cold open sequence where our heroes rescue snipes from a maximum security train has some genuine thrills and solid gunplay, like when the team uses a high tension wire to clothesline enemy sentries on a locomotive's roof. But the watered down PG-13 rating is an inescapable misstep for the picture. Unable to show blood or really violent action, every scene is chopped to pieces, leaving nothing but a loud and messy experience vaguely resembling explosive carnage. I honestly don't think there was a single action shot lasting longer than a second here, resulting in a confusing experience that never allows the stunts to breathe or the battles to have any chronology. Hang on! How do you arrive? Time to go! Awful and incomprehensible cinematography, it's hard to tell what's a visual effect and what's practical, but a number of explosions and other sequences look decidedly computer animated. Which leads me to believe director Patrick Hughes blew all of his money securing the cast. The heavy, drum-like beat of Brian Tyler's score is mostly reworked cues from the previous films, but is serviceable enough. Unraveling at an unrelenting yet laborious pace, this is a preposterous experience that has absolutely no lasting impact on moral integrity. For fans of these iconic heroes, The Expendables 3 delivers enough enjoyment for a single viewing, but the bloodless and poorly constructed fights are a disappointing waste of superstar potential. Well, now that that's out of my system, here's some of your reviews. There's no other way to say it, everyone thought this is a huge letdown. But still, it was decently enjoyable. You scored it a 5 out of 10. Not nearly on par with its predecessors, I'm reluctantly scoring this in all right as well. Finally tonight, let's check out Gone Girl. Adapted from Gillian Flynn's 2012 novel of the same name, this David Fincher mystery thriller was an immediate box office hit, grossing over four times its $60 million budget only a month after its October 3rd, 2014 release. 
Following the suspicious disappearance of his wife, Ben Affleck is forced to deal with a growing media circus that begins to suspect he may be complicit in the crime. This, however, is a gross oversimplification of the R-rated narrative. The twisty 149-minute plot is presented in parallel narratives, one set in the present, the other in flashbacks. It's during the latter that we follow Rosamund Pike's side of the story, where her undeniable talent positively commands the screen. The gorgeous Rosamund has been kicking around Hollywood for over a decade, beginning her career as a Bond girl, and she's quietly turned in a dozen great performances since then, but it's her sultry portrayal of a forgotten housewife in Gone Girl that will undoubtedly make her a household name. And I wouldn't be surprised if she scored her first Oscar nomination next year. Although this show-stopping performance all but overshadows her co-stars, Neil Patrick Harris as an abusive former flame, Kim Dickens as an unrelenting homicide investigator, and even Tyler Perry as a savvy lawyer contributes some very effective beats in their supporting roles. Affleck, meanwhile, is the true center of the picture, and he carries the delicate emotional range on his broad shoulders easily. When he's forced to improvise and lie regarding his missing wife during a live television interview, View, he balances his anxiety and confidence brilliantly. Earlier in the picture, unable to recount his wife's blood type, a younger officer is eager to pin the crime on Affleck. He reminds Dickens that the simplest explanation is often the correct one, to which the doubtful detective responds, Actually, I have never found that to be true. So, your wife has no friends here. Is she kind of standoffish? Ivy League? Rubs people the wrong way? She's from New York. She's complicated. She's got very high standards. Type A? Well, that can make you crazy if you're not like that. You seem pretty laid back. Type B. Speaking of which, Amy's blood type. God, I don't know. I have to look it up at the house. You don't know if she has friends. You don't know what she does all day. And you don't know your wife's blood type. Sure y'all are married. This is a smart and modern story with realistic dialogue that employs the unreliable narrator mechanic in wonderful ways that are best left unspoiled. In fact, the audience is kept in the dark and misdirected almost as often as the other characters, making the few bits of dramatic irony that much more effective. Despite the layered and pitch-perfect editing, this complex narrative does take a few too many detours before arriving at its satisfying conclusion. Fincher's meticulous attention to detail pays off with some gorgeous cinematography, with every part of the anamorphic frame lined with sharp lighting and cold backgrounds. The passive-sounding score from Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross is a droning and uncomfortable one, constantly instilling a sense of dread and uneasiness. A harsh yet stylish examination of 21st century marriage, dishonesty, and the media's obsession with a good story, this is a decidedly original and fascinating film every adult should seek out and watch. Gone Girl is a sexy thriller with a fantastic and unpredictable narrative. And here are some of your comments about it. This is a smart and twisty thriller that demands your full attention. And we both agree, it was an awesome movie. Finally tonight, let's check out your tweet critiques to see what you're saying about films currently playing in theaters. If you see a new movie in theaters, tweet your review with the JPMN hashtag. Tonight we reviewed five movies from the summer. Next week we'll take a look at five movies from the fall. Nightcrawler, The Theory of Everything, The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1, Horrible Bosses 2, and coming out next week, The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies. Once you've seen these films, share your opinions by voting in the polls below or by leaving a comment review. And if you're tired of seeing the same dozen people submit reviews every week, then leave your own in the comments. I read every single one and do my best to include a variety of opinions. And if you'd like to watch more Movie Night reviews, check out the related videos on the right, or click subscribe to be notified of all future uploads. And tell your friends or something, because I could really use some more views on the show. I'm working my ass off and not quite seeing the return I used to. Anyway, be sure to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, Instagram, or Letterboxd for updates between episodes. Once again, my name is Jonathan Paula. Thank you for watching and listening. Until next time, have a good movie night.